This brings us to a wondrous and slightly perplexing topic, that of carbocation rearrangements. I want you to imagine a simple alkene like this one shown here, who's being stirred in the presence of HBr. Naturally, the pi electrons in this double bond are going to come out and attack the hydrogen, thrusting these two electrons up onto the bromine to release free bromide. Of course, our hydrogen has a choice. Does it attach to the carbon on the left or the carbon on the right? Well, according to Markovnikov's rule, it's going to attach to the carbon that has more hydrogens, which is the one on the right in this case. The reason, of course, that it does that is because doing so gives us the more stable secondary carbocation. If it attached to the carbon on the left, then the carbon on the right would be the one with the positive charge, which would be a primary carbocation. At this point, of course, the free bromide can now come in here, attach to this carbon, plug that hole, and give me this product. Oddly enough, however, this product is the minor product in this reaction. And you might wonder, why? Well, as it turns out, in this particular case and cases like it, the hydrogen that's on this carbon right here can do something really, really weird. This hydrogen can take these two electrons that it's sharing with this carbon and march next door and thrust them into this positively charged carbon center. Doing so causes this carbon to be positively charged, giving me this product. Now take a look at that. Once again, this yellow hydrogen just walked next door. This carbon is now positively charged. This type of movement of a hydrogen with two electrons from one position to the position next door is called a 1-2 hydride shift. Now you might ask yourself, why in the world would a hydrogen ever do this? Here's the reason. You'll note that this intermediate is a secondary carbocation, whereas this one is a tertiary carbocation. Thus, if you have a molecule whose carbocation intermediate can become more stable by having a hydride move from one carbon to the carbon next door, it will do so. This intermediate now reacts with our free bromide, which comes in, plugs in this hole, forming a bond with this carbon center to give us this product. Now there's another type of carbocation rearrangement, the 1,2 methyl shift. Very, very similar. If I have an alkene like this, we can imagine the electrons coming out, attacking a hydrogen. In this particular case, which we have HCl, these electrons get thrust up onto the chlorine, releasing free chloride. And the hydrogen, of course, attaches to the carbon on the right because it is the one that is bonded to more hydrogens, giving the more stable secondary carbocation intermediate. Now we could imagine the chloride coming in here, plugging in this hole to give us this product. But of course, it's a minor product. Why? Well, the reason is because this methyl can move one position to the right. It does so by grabbing these two electrons, marching over with them next door, thrusting them into this hole. That then leaves this carbon center positively charged, giving me this intermediate. This type of movement is exactly like the movement we just saw, except it's the movement of a methyl group, a CH3, instead of a hydride, an H. This is therefore called a 1,2 methyl shift. When my chloride comes in to plug this more stable carbocation hole, it forms this as my major product. Thus we can see that if we have a carbocation intermediate that can be made more stable by having either an H or a CH3 move one position, then it will do so. Let's see if you can answer this question. Will a rearrangement occur in this example? I've got this molecule right here reacting with HBr. Will it occur? Well, as you can imagine, mechanistically, these electrons are going to come out and attack the hydrogen, breaking the hydrogen br bromine bond and releasing free bromide. The hydrogen, of course, bonds with the carbon to the right to generate the more stable secondary carbocation intermediate. Will a rearrangement occur? What we have to do to answer that question is look next door. Is there a methyl stuck? on the carbon to the left or on the carbon to the right of this carbocation? The answer is no. Is there a hydrogen stuck to either of those two carbons? The answer is yes. So will a neighboring hydrogen shift over one position in this case? Well, if the hydrogen shown here to the left did so, then what would happen 
is we would now have a positive charge on this carbon. Question is, has anything improved? I've got a secondary carbocation here, and you'll note that if I have a hydride shift, that is the hydrogen stuck to this carbon moving over one position, I now end up with the positive charge on this carbon, which is also a secondary carbocation. Has the stability improved? I've gone from a secondary to a secondary. The answer is no. So will a rearrangement occur? No, it will not. Why? Because doing so doesn't result in a more stable carbocation. Thus, 1,2 hydride shifts or 1,2 methyl shifts do not occur if doing so doesn't improve the stability of the carbocation. As a result, the major product of this reaction will occur with the bromide coming in and plugging this hole, forming a bond with that carbon and giving me this product. Which brings us to a wondrous problem set. Which of the following carbocations is likely to rearrange? Now I want you to pause the video for a moment and see if you can answer this on your own. I will show you the answers momentarily. We will look at them one by one. First of all, we're going to look at option number one. Here is that molecule that I've drawn by hand. You'll note there is a carbocation at this carbon center. Now, of course, as you understand, there are hydrogens on either side of them that we just aren't drawing. I've gone ahead and drawn one of them here. There are, of course, two hydrogens bonded to this carbon, and there are two hydrogens bonded to the carbon to the left. Because it's totally symmetrical, it doesn't matter which direction I look. Will that hydrogen shift? Well, if it did so, what would occur is the hydrogen would take these two electrons that it's sharing with this carbon, and it would march next door. As it plugged this hole to quench this positive charge, it would now leave a positive charge at this position. The positive charge here is a secondary carbocation, and this one is also a secondary carbocation. Will this rearrangement occur? No, it will not. Why? Because I haven't improved things at all. I've gone from a secondary to secondary. Equal stability means no shift. Let's look at example number two. I've got this carbocation. Now I can imagine a hydride shifting from next door, but that would probably just go from a secondary to a secondary. Or what if one of these two methyls shifted? Well, we'll have this methyl over here shift just by moving over this carbon, which is sharing electrons with this carbon, moves over and plugs this hole. That leaves a positive charge at the position that he left. Will this occur? Well, let's see. We've gone from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. Is that an improvement? Absolutely. So this rearrangement will occur. Option three. I've got a secondary carbocation, and I can have an adjacent hydrogen. I can have the one up top or the one to the left go. I don't think it would make a difference in this case. Move over and plug that hole. By doing so, it leaves me a positive charge at this position. I've gone from a secondary carbocation to a secondary carbocation. Have things improved? No. So will this rearrangement occur? No. Here's my last example. I've got a CH2 right here, and I've kind of drawn the hydrogens thrusting out in this direction. Positive charge right here. This is, of course, a primary carbocation, which looks extremely unstable. What is bonded to the carbon next door? Well, I have a methyl right here. Can that methyl shift by moving one position over? Yes, it can. If it does, it takes these two electrons that this carbon is sharing with this carbon, marches next door, plugs in that hole, and now note this methyl is now up here. And this carbon now gets a positive charge. I've gone from a primary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. Have things improved? Yes. So will that rearrangement occur? Oh, yeah. Here's another problem for you to look at. Draw the major organic product generated in the reaction shown here. Now, I'm not going to give you the answer to this one, but I will advise you to be cautious because it does involve a hydride shift. This brings us to our final topic for this lecture, that of alkene stability. This is just something I want you to memorize, and I can explain to you in greater detail why. Similar to the way that I said that tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations, which are more stable than primary carbocations. As it turns out, the more substituents, which are non-hydrogens that you have attached to an alkene's double-bonded carbons, the more stable that alkene will be. 
Let me show you this here. If all of these R's represent anything that's not a hydrogen, the most stable type of alkene is the one shown all the way to the left, one in which each of the doubly bonded carbons is stuck or bonded to the maximum amount of non-hydrogens. The second most stable arrangement is where you have three things stuck to my doubly bonded carbons, followed by just two things, followed by just one thing. One thing is the least stable. So of all of the alkenes shown here, the least stable is one that only has one non-hydrogen bonded to its doubly bonded carbons. And the most stable is the one that has four. This observation is called Zaitsev's rule. Which brings us to our final question. Which of the following is the most stable alkene? The way you determine this is look at each one of these examples, doubly bonded carbons, and you ask yourself, which of these examples has its doubly bonded carbons bonded to the maximum number of non-hydrogens? That is, four. Whichever one of those that is will be the most stable example. That brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope that you'll tune in for part two of chapter four, in which I will introduce you to a whole plethora of different reactions that we can do with alkenes that are super cool and very useful. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.